we are going to get back to Virgil's Aeneid. Now, if you remember last week, we were in Carthage. And boy, oh boy, it was the passion of the queen. Dido was in love. The gods came down and said, Aeneas, you got to get the heck out of here. He said, okay, I'm out. And Dido did not take it well. And she's dead. So now we go into book five, which is called Games and a Conflagration. Interesting heading for a book. Uh, we are going to be skipping through a bit here and there, so it might be... Well, well, we'll, we'll find out as we go. Cutting through the waves blown dark by a chill wind, Aeneas held his ships firmly on course for a mid-sea crossing. And remember, they are leaving Carthage, so that's like North Africa, heading, trying to just go straight up to Italy. But he kept his eyes upon the city far astern, now bright with poor Alyssa's pyre. What caused that blaze remained unknown to watchers out at sea. But what they knew of a great love profaned in anguish, and a desperate woman's nerve led every Trojan heart into foreboding. So as they go, they look back and they see, you see this big bonfire behind them back at Carthage. I'm like, what, what the hell is that? I don't know. But, hmm. A desperate woman's nerve. That doesn't sound good. So for some reason, they happen to be thinking about great love profaned and a woman's nerve. When they had gained the offing east and north, no land in sight now, but sky everywhere and everywhere the sea, a thunderhead towered above them, bringing gloom and storm with shuddering dusky water. Aeneas's helmsman, who we strangely hear about for the first time, Palinurus, called from his high stern deck, Why have these clouds massed on the height of heaven? Father Neptune, what are you brewing for us? So you know how... Like in Star Trek, when things are happening and all of a sudden you hear the name of a specific background character. Usually it means something. So similarly, all of a sudden we hear Aeneas's helmsman is named Palinurus. So let, let's remember that. Keep that in mind. On this he made the seamen shorten sail and bend to the oars. He trimmed his fluttering canvas more to catch the wind and said, Aeneas! Lord Commander, even if Jupiter should pledge his word for it, I could not hope to make landfall on Italy in this weather. It's thickening up, and now the wind blows hard out of the murky west a beam of us. No bucking it. We cannot make our north in. Seeing that fortune has the upper hand, I say give in and follow where she calls. No long reach eastward, there's a loyal coast. I think the land named for your brother, Eryx, and the Sicilian ports. If I remember rightly my star heights and my miles at sea. The good commander said, For some time now I've noticed that the veering winds demand and how you fought it uselessly. Change course, haul yards and sail around. Could any soil be more agreeable to me, or any where I would rather moor these tired ships than Sicily, home of my Darden friend, Achistes, and the ashes of my father? So they got bad weather, and if you have ever been sailing, uh, weather determines everything. Weather determines if you can go at all, weather determines how you go, where the wind is pushing determines, again, everything. Basically, if you're on a sailboat and the wind is coming from behind you, then you just open the sails. You turn them slightly if the wind is slightly off-center and you get pushed forward. Uh, if the wind is not not from directly behind you but from the side at all, uh, you can do what's called tacking. Tacking is a giant pain in the ass and it's where you turn the sail most mostly sideways to one degree or another depending on where the wind is and have it kind of push you sideways and then try to keep moving moving forward, but going sideways as you go to try to inch forward kind of like a snake. 
Um, and then if the wind is in front of you, well, then you're not going, <laughs> you're not going anywhere. Uh, that's all if there's just gentle or moderate wind. Obviously, if there's crazy wind and a storm, you're in a lot much, much more trouble than that. So they're just trying to sail a relatively short distance, but there's a big storm. They can't do it. Like, we got to put in, we got to try to get somewhere. So head east to Sicily. Um, do, 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 do. Okay, so they get to they get to Sicily, they make landfall, and then the next morning, Aeneas talks to everybody. Sons of Dardanus, in the high line of gods, the months are spent, the rounding year fulfilled, since we interred my godlike father's bones and mourned and blessed his altars. So in the previous travels, when they had been traveling do 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 do, do all around <clears throat> the Mediterranean uh, they had stopped at Sicily, and that's actually where Aeneas's father, Anchises, died, and they buried him there. And it's been a full year since that happened. Because remember, Aeneas had shacked up with Dido for, for just about a year. And now they're back. And if I am not mistaken, now that day has come, which I shall hold in bitterness and honor all my life. Gods, you would have it so. Were I today exiled in Libyan sands, or caught at sea off Argos, or detained in walled Mycenae, still I should carry out my anniversary vows and ceremonies, heaping the altars as I should with offerings. But now, beyond all expectation, here we stand beside his ashes and his bones. And surely not, I think, without the great god's will and contrivance, carried here off course to enter kindly havens. Come then, everyone, we'll celebrate this holiday in joy. Let us ask for propitious winds, and when our city is laid out, our temples blessed in Father's honor, may he grant each year that I perform this ritual. Trojan-born Achistes gives each ship two heads of oxen. Welcome the hearth gods to the feast, our own and those of our host cherishes. Then, too, if we, mu if we trust, nine days from now, dawn lifts for mortals her dear light, and bears the world with sun rays, I shall plan and hold contests for Trojans. First a ship race, then we'll see who wins it running, who stands out in pride of strength at javelin and archery, or dares to fight with rawhide on his hands. May all compete for prizes and the palm. Now silence all, garland your brows with leaves. So what is he talking about here? Well, it's the anniversary of his father's death and burial. And so on the anniversary, there's usually some sort of a celebration. So they're going to do sacrifices, because you always got to sacrifice to the gods. And they're going to have contests, competitions of strength and skill and athleticism and cunning. And this goes way, way back to the Greeks. And if you remember, this goes way, way back to even in the Iliad. There are uh, times when the fighting pauses and they... Uh, basically, this, this happens with Patroclus' death, right? After Patroclus dies, there's a truce. Uh, Achilles goes to... Uh, they, they bury him there. They hold games and then they go back to the fighting. So... Aeneas is going to do the same thing to honor his father. And also, of course, in ancient times, there were festivals and athletic competitions. So whenever they can, whenever in an epic poem they can sneak in, like, oh yeah, so this is why we have athletic competitions. Because they did it way back then. Uh, do, 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 do. So... Ooh, so this is cool. So before that actually happens. At this, he shaded his own brows with myrtle, loved by his mother. Helamus did the same, Acestes ripe with age, the boy Ascanius, and all the young men followed suit. So everybody's getting ready in their ritual clothing, and they're putting uh, plants, 
wreaths on their heads. Aeneas left the assembly now and made his way with many thousands to the funeral mound, walking amid the crowd. Once there, he poured the ritual libations, two of wine, two of fresh milk, and two of victim's blood. Then cast down purple morning flowers and said, I greet and bless you, sacred father, bless you, ashes and shade and soul, paternal soul I vainly rescued once. It was not given me with you beside me to explore the coasts and plains of Italy, nor to discover whatever it may be, Ausonian Tiber. Dot, dot, dot. So far he had proceeded in his speech, when from the depths of mound and shrine a snake came, huge and undulant, with seven coils, enveloping the barrow peacefully and gliding on amid the altars. Azure flecks mottled its back, a dappled sheen of gold set all his scales ablaze, as when a rainbow on the clouds facing the sun throws out a thousand colors. Aeneas paused, amazed and silent, while deliberately the snake's long column wound among the bowls and polished cups, browsing the festal dishes, and from the altars where he fed, again slid harmlessly to earth below the tomb. Now all the more intent, the celebrant took up his father's ritual, uncertain whether he should think the snake the local god, the genius of the place, or the attendant spirit of his father. He sacrificed a pair of sheep, a pair of swine, a pair of heifers with black hides, then poured out shallow bowls of wine and called the ghost of great Anchises, the death shade released from Acheron. Then his companions, each in his capacity, brought in their own glad offerings. They piled the altars, knifed the beasts, placed cauldrons on the fires, and at their ease upon the grass raked up live coals under the spits to broil the flesh. So they set out sacrifices. And sacrifices in ancient times, uh, I mentioned this before, it wasn't just animal sacrifices, right? Every time they did a sacrifice, they would pour out wine, they would sacrifice uh, grains and barley and uh, vegetables and fruits, even loaves of bread, and then also they would sacrifice animals. So they perform all, this, all these sacrifices, they have all this stuff set up. Aeneas is embarking on another epic speech, and all of a sudden he stops because this huge snake comes out of the ground, wraps itself around the tomb of his father, and comes back off, sort of winds its way around all the sacrificial stuff, and then goes back down under the ground. And everyone's like, oh, oh shit, what was that? But again, because it's very peaceful, and it doesn't attack anybody, and it doesn't disturb any of the sacrifice stuff, um, they assume it's a good omen, it's a friendly spirit or local god or the spirit of his father himself, and they proceed as planned. Yes, it's a, it's a good snake, a good serpent. And then all the men strip down, get greased up, and are ready to compete. But first, the prizes were set out on view midfield. Blessed tripods, fresh, grown, fresh green crowns and palms, rewards for winners, armor too, and robes infused with crimson dye, gold bars and silver. Next, from a central eminence, a trumpet sang out for the opening of the games. The well-matched entrants in the first event were heavy oared ships, four from the whole fleet. <coughs> so the first event, a ship race. We have four ships competing. Uh, Menestheus's eager oarsman drove the Sea Beast. That's one of the names of the ship. That's a good one. The Sea Beast. Uh, Menestheus of Italy he soon would be, from whose name came the clan of Memmius. Then Gaius captain, captained the Chimera, huge in length and weight, big as a town afloat, which Darden oarsmen in three tiers drove onward, surging together at three banks of oars. So then we have the Chimera. Then he for whom the Sergian house was named, Sergestus, 
rode the great centaur. Cloanthus, from whom your family came, Roman Cluentheus, rode in the blue in the sea blue Scylla. So just like today, we name things after all sorts of silly uh, mythological characters and so on and so forth. The names of these ships that the Trojans were using were named the Sea Beast, the Chimera, the Centaur, and the Scylla, which is adorable. Uh, out at sea, well off the foaming beach, there is a rock, submerged and beaten by high seas at times, when northwest winds in winter hide the stars. But in calm weather, it stands quietly above the unmoving water, a level perch and happy sunning place for gulls. Aeneas made a green goal there with an ilex bow, wishing well marked for sailors in his charge, the point where they should turn and double back on the long course. Uh, now they drew lots for places, blah, 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 blah. The crews, for their part, garlanded with poplar, bare to the waist, glistening with rubbing oil, mm -hmm, well settled on their planks, reaching ahead to oar hafts, listening hard for the starting call. Throbbing excitement seemed to void their hearts, all beating high in appetite for glory. Then, as the brilliant trumpet gave its note, they all surged forward from the starting line, no lagging. Heaven echoed shouts, and channels under the crewmen's pulling turned to foam. Go! <laughs> uh, one moment. You got that? Um, yes. I don't know. Uh, hold one. I know it's all throbbing. Anybody we know? Hi. Buffalo and Sting? Oh my gosh, yeah, you guys are so funny. Okay. Everything's fine. Yes. Oh, so much throbbing. Throbbing, half naked dudes. It's great. Um, yeah, so typically. Uh, hold on, buddy. Hold on. Mom is coming right back. What's the, what's the matter? What's the matter, buddy? Mommy's coming right back. She's talking to somebody outside. It's fine. Do you want to say hi to the people? You want to come over and say hi? Well, come on. Are you very sleepy still? Um, I don't want to see, see you guys. Well, we can't actually see anybody. They're just looking at me. But we can see them chatting here. See all these? Those are all the names of the people so who are watching. Supply, soap supply delivery. Oh. It was very fast. I wasn't prepared for them to come. Okay. So quickly. Come on, okay. Buddy. Everything okay? Yeah. All right. Okay, do you want to watch them? <laughs> My goodness. Okay. Everything's fine now. Uh, yeah, so typically in ancient competitions race any kinds of race would involve going down a stretch going around some sort of uh, a marker and then coming back uh, yes there were also like one-way sprints but those weren't nearly as popular and famous as the the return trip uh, so much so and at one point I knew way too much about this kind of thing uh, there's a one of the ancient tragedies is Prometheus Bound, and it's all about um, Prometheus, the Titan. Uh, after he had, he was after he had given fire to man, he was punished. He was tied to a rock, and eagles came every day and ate his liver, and then they would regrow. A uh, whole long story. So anyway, there's a play about that, and. Prometheus is just stuck in the middle of this of the stage, uh, and other people come in and talk to him, and then they leave, and this whole thing. And we read in one of my classes in grad school, we we read it, or most of it at least, in the Greek. And when I was in grad school, at least, we had, in order to graduate, you had to write a certain number of papers. But you could sort of like in any class, you could say, "I'm going to write a paper in this class," and then 
the professor would be like, okay, what do you want to write about? And then you'd do it and whatever. So what I found really interesting in the Greek text for that play, as it turns out, there was a lot of um, there's a lot of words and imagery that had to do with racing. And so I ended up, so I wrote a paper about, about that and how even while Prometheus stays still, the language that the audience was hearing would be so evocative of uh, motion and running and racing that, um, yeah, anyway, that was... I'm trying to remember exactly what the, the point of it was, but, but essentially that the words that they used were that Prometheus was that marker point, the terma, that somebody would have to go and race around to come back. So every, character's, every character was coming in and racing and using Prometheus as the, the sort of like the focal point. I got an A. I don't know. They liked it. <laughs> Is it going to go cool out there? Yeah, we got to remember that that is blocking the driveway. No big tellers. Okay. Tellers. Yeah. Tell my... Uh, cool. So they go off. They're straining. They are racing. So racing ahead at the very start was Gaius. Close on him came Cloanthus. Better served by oarsmen, but his ship's weight slowed him up. Behind them in an equal interval, the sea beast and the centaur vied for third. And now the sea beast had it. Now the mighty centaur took the lead. Now both together, prows on a line, with their long keels plowed up the sea salt water. As they all came near the offshore rock, the halfway mark, the leader, Gaius, hailed Minoites at the tiller. Why keep so far to starboard, man? This way, hug shore, making the turn. What if the oar blades graze the rock to port? Let others shear off wide to seaward. Heedless, in his fear of a hidden ledge, Minoites swung the prow toward the open sea. Gaius again cried out, Now why bear off? Stick to the rocks, Minoites! And at that instant, looking back, he saw Cloanthus just behind on the inner track. Between the ships of Gaius and the rocks, he shaved his way to port, then suddenly shot past him as the turn and got away into safe water, leaving the mark behind. Young Gaius flared up now, ablaze to the bottom of his soul with indignation, and tears wetted his cheeks. Without a thought for dignity or the safety of his crew, he tossed cautious Minoites overboard into the sea. Then he himself as steersman took the tiller, and as captain cheered his oarsmen as he swung the rudder over, heading for shore. When heavy old Minoites slowly at last emerged from the sea bottom, drenched and steaming, up he climbed and sat atop the dry ledge. Trojans had laughed to see his plunge, his swimming, and now laughed again as he coughed up seawater from his chest. I know, right? All of a sudden, and sports. To the two behind, to Menestheus and Sergestus, the happy thought had come of passing Gaius. Now he had lost speed, and Sergestus led, nearing the rock, though not by a full boat length, for Sea Beast by her prow came up alongside. See, even boat racing can sound exciting if you if you read it and perform it the right way. Um, this goes on for a while. Let's see. Let's skip, skip ahead a little bit. Uh, do, 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 do. And now the shouts from shore grew twice as loud as all the watching crowd cheered for Menestheus, filling the air with din. One crew fought off the shame of losing honor, theirs already, glory won. They'd give their lives for fame, but luck empowered the others, who felt that they could do it, and so could. The prows now even, they were close indeed to winning, had Cloanthus not stretched out his hands to seaward, and in burst of prayer called on the gods to hear his vows. O gods, whose power is on the deep sea, and whose waves I'm racing over, I shall place with joy a snow-white bull before your altars here upon this shore, in payment of my vow, and fling the parts into the sea and pour a stream of wine. So, one of the interesting things that we see with sacrifices 
in epic poems and ancient works sacrifices are really important right you've got to you've got to sacrifice to the gods if you well if you want good things to happen but especially if you don't want bad things to happen but there's a there's a component of sacrificing that works a little bit like um i love time travel and bill and ted's excellent adventure but there's a there's a mechanic to to sacrifices that's sort of like in bill and ted's because if you promise the gods if you make a declaration that i'm going to make a sacrifice oftentimes that is effectively as good as you having already made the sacrifice you can get the benefit immediately for something that you then will need to complete later on, right? So it's sort of like in Bill and Ted's, where like they're missing the car keys, and like, wait, but what if we already stole the car keys? Aha, we have the car keys, <laughs> right? It's exactly Savage Punch. It's an IOU. Yes, and but also, <laughs> yes, if you don't complete it, really bad stuff happens. Uh, so here, they're racing, and Cloanth, they're neck and neck, and Cloanthus says to the gods, God, I love you, God, so much, I'm going to give you the best sacrifice in the world. And again, because he says he's going to do it, the gods listen. Under the depths of water, all the Nereids, Forcus's company, and virgin Panopia heard his prayer, and Father Portunus, the harbor god, with his great hand, impelled the Scylla onward. Swifter than a gust out of the east, or arrow on the wing, she ran for land and took her place in the deep harbor. Then, when all were called together, Anchises' son proclaimed by the loud crier, Cloanthus, winner, and veiled his temple, temples with green bay. So that's it. At the, they're neck and neck. They're racing furiously. One of them says... Gods, I'm going to give you the best dang sacrifice. And wouldn't you know it, the god of harbors uh, gives him a little push, and he wins. Done. That is it. Uh, <laughs> Zardoz, another very good question. You, you got to find one. If you promise, you got to find one. Uh, then we get a bunch of, of cool prizes, essentially. So the winner, Cloanthus, he gets a um, he gets a laurel, essentially a wreath to wear around his head. Moreover, to each contending ship, he gave a choice of bullocks, three to each, with wine and one great bar of silver to be borne away. Additional rewards went to the captains: a cloak woven with gold thread for the winner, bordered with a meander's double line of Meliboean crimson. Pictured there, the royal boy amidst blah 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 blah. So there's a design on his cloak. Uh, to him whose valor won him second place, a triple shirt of mail close wrought with links of polished gold, a trophy of Aeneas's victory over Demolius near the river Simois under Troy's high wall. So a, um, a scale mail shirt, essentially. This shirt Aeneas gave to Menestheus as an honor and as protection in the wars to come. Phegeus and Sigaris, his body servants, could barely carry all its folds on shoulders braced for it. Though in other days, Demolius in this shirt and on the run had harried straggling Trojans. Uh, the third prize Aeneas gave was a pair of brazen cauldrons and silver cups. Blah, 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 blah. And, uh, yeah. So that is the end of the boat race. So now that the ship race had been run, Aeneas walked to a grassy field that wooded hills curved all around, a vale and an arena. There, with a crowd of thousands, the great captain betook himself and took a central place, a seat on a platform. Now he called on those who, uh, whom hope for gain led to compete in running and set out prizes for them. So next, we're going to get a foot race. And it lists out all the people who are going to join, uh, which we don't need to get all involved with. And he also lists out all of the prizes he's going to give out. And 
there's going to be prizes not just for the winner, but for second place and third place. Uh, so they get ready, they run out, do, 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 they're running. So, yeah, there's a, a silly thing happens. Basically, one of the competitors slips because they happen to be running through a place where they had sacrificed animals before. So there's blood on the ground. It's a whole thing. Uh, after the races had been held and prizes given, now... Aeneas said, anyone who has a fighting heart and fortitude, step forward, put up your hands for the encasing hide. He set a double prize then for the boxing, a bullock for the winner dressed with gold and snowy wool, a sword and a choice helm as comfort for the beaten man. Straight away, without an instant's pause in his huge power, Dares got up amid the murmurous crowd, the one who had held his ground with Paris. The man, too, who knocked out the champion Butes beside the burial mound where Hector lies. Butes, a giant boxer, bragged of coming from the Bebrickian tribe of Amicus. But Dares stretched him half dead on the sand. So powerful, the man reared up his head for combat, showed his shoulders breadth, his reach with left and right, threw punches at the air. Who would fight him? Among all those men, no one dared put the leather on his hands. Thinking all had withdrawn, yielding the prize, he took his stance before Aeneas's feet and made no bones of grasping the bull's horn in his left hand and saying, Son of the goddess, if no one dares commit himself to boxing, how long must I stand here? How long may I properly be kept waiting? Say the word and I lead off the prize. Then all the Dardans murmured, Let the man have what was promised. Acestes, though had hard words for Entellus, sitting behind him on a couch of turf. Entellus, what price now that in the old days you were our strongest fighting man? Will you sit here so meek and let a prize like that be carried off without a fight? Where now is our god, Eryx, whom you called your teacher, but let down in the end? What of your fame through all Trinacria and the booty hung about your hall? Gotta have a hall full of booty. Boutes, yes. Uh, this Boutes is B-U-T-E-S uh, with a fancy doodad over the E. Entellus softly answered, Not that love of honor or appetite for glory have given way, beaten by fear. I'm slowed by age. My blood runs feebly now without heat, and my strength is spent, my body muscle-bound. Had I that youth again that I had once, and that this arrogant fellow counts on, I would need no setting on, no prize, no pretty steer to make me meet him. Gifts don't concern me. Oh, he would do it, but he's so old. Oh, all these characters suffering in their old age. I feel it. I feel them. It's like, man, if I was young again, I would do it. After saying this, he tossed into the ring a pair of gauntlets, monstrously heavy, which the fighter Eryx used to bind on his forearms and hands, hard, raw hide. And the crowd looked on amazed. So huge they were! of seven ox hides, barred with lead and iron sewn to stiffen them. Dares himself stared more than anyone and moved away, reluctant for about. Meanwhile, Aeneas's great-souled son picked up and tried the gauntlets, turning their rolled-up weight this way and that. The veteran Entellus now spoke up in his deep voice. Sorry, I was used in the wrong voice for Entellus. What then if anyone had seen Hercules' gloves and the grim fight here on this very shore? 
These were the armor worn by your own brother, Eryx. Even now you see them stained with blood and spattered brains. In these at last he faced the great Alcides. And in these I used to fight, while hotter blood sustained me, and age had not worn out as yet or scattered snow on my brows. But if this Trojan Dares refuses our equipment, if Aeneas in fairness so decides, and my opponent Acestes nods, we'll equalize the fight. Here I give up the oxhide gloves of Eryx. Breathe easier. Pull off your Trojan gloves. Hard, yeah, hard rawhide. Uh, to do. He threw the double mantle from his shoulders, bared his great arms and legs, all thew and bone, and took his stand, gigantic, in the arena. Uh, now, with paternal care, Anchises' son brought gauntlets of the same weight out to tie on both men's hands. Then instantly, each in his stance moved on his toes and put his fists high up in the air holding his head well back out of the range of blows. So they're doing like the good old classic, this kind of boxing, right? Head way back. Good times. They sparred with rights and lefts, each trying to sting the other into unguarded fighting. One had speed of footwork and elan of youth, the other giant mass and brawn, but his slow knees quivered and buckled. Painful gasping shook him, huge as he was. Oh, he's so old. Often they punched and missed. Often they hit, thudding on flanks and ribs, or making chests resound. Then flurrying punches pummeled ears and temples, and their jaws would crunch at every solid blow. Entellus gravely stood in the same unshifting stance, watchful to roll with punches or to slip them. Dares, like one assa assaulting a tall city, or laying siege to a stronghold on a height, tried this approach, then that, explored the ground on all sides cleverly, came on, came in from various angles, all to no avail. Then surging up, Entellus poised his right and threw it, but the other in his quickness saw the blow descending, and just in time slipped out from under. All Entellus's force being spent on air by his own impetus, the mighty man fell mightily to earth, as ponderously as, from time to time, a hollow and uprooted pine will fall on Arimanthus or the range of Ida. Teucrians and Sicilians and their rivalry rose together as a shout went up, and running out, Acestes was the first to help the old man, his contemporary, up from the ground. Now, neither hurt and slowed or shaken by the fall, the fighting man returned to combat hotter than before, his power excited by his anger. Shame aroused him, too, in his own sense of manhood, so that he went for Dares, driving him headlong over the ring, redoubling cuffs with right and left alike, no pause, no rest, as thick and fast as hail, drumming on roofs in a big storm were the old hero's blows, with both hands battering and spinning Dares. Fatherly Aeneas would not sit by while this fury went further. So berserk Entellus was in the rancor of his soul. He stopped the fight and saved bone-weary Dares, saying to comfort him, Poor fellow, how could rashness take you this way? Don't you feel a force now more than mortal is against you and heaven's will has changed? We'll bow to that. So, speaking loudly, he broke off the battle, and loyal shipmates took Dares in hand, weak knees, his head wobbling from side to side, spitting out teeth mixed in with gobs of blood. They led him to the ships and then, recalled, received the helm and sword, leaving the palm and bullocks for Entellus. The old champion, glorying in his courage and his prize, spoke out, Son of the goddess Teucrians all, now see what power was in me in my prime, and see the death from which you rescued Dares. Uh, he set himself to face the bull that stood there, prize of the battle, then drew back his right, and from his full height lashed his hard glove out between the horns. The impact smashed the skull and fragmented the brains. 
Down went the ox, a quiver, to sprawl dying on the ground. The man stood over it and in deep tones proclaimed, Here is a better life in place of Dares, Eryx. Here I lay down my gauntlets and my art. So kind of a crazy end to that one. We get the old man in Tellus, who's like, he is solid. He's just standing there, just, he doesn't move very much. He winds up for a great big blow. Dares dodges. What are you going to do? Uh, Entellus just falls down. The other guy didn't do anything. They help him up. They do not call the fight at that point. But they get him up. He's He goes crazy. He just starts beating the crap out of Dares. And then Aeneas calls the fight. So that the old man doesn't beat up this younger dude. They drag him away. And that is the end. But interestingly, as Aeneas is calling this fight, he says, A force now more than mortal is against you, and heaven's will has changed. We will bow to that. Now, does that sound familiar to anybody? What just happened in the last chapter? Everything was going great with Dido and Aeneas married. But heaven's will changed. And what did Aeneas immediately do? He bowed to that. <laughs> so this is sort of a reinforcement that no matter how things are going... If the gods all of a sudden give you a sign or actually come down and tell you that something has to change, well, you got to do it, and you got to do it right now. <laughs> so nobody be upset with me about Dido because I had to do what I had to do. And then we get this horrifying thing where they bring in the bull that's his prize, which again would be sacrificed anyway at some point, but, um, but this guy instead is like, and look at this. And just hits it so hard that it kills it, and then it drops dead. He's like, basically, see, that's what I that's what I would have done to the other guy if they let the fight go on. Which is kind of disturbing, but boxers, what are you gonna do? The sweet science. Immediately after this, Aeneas invited all so minded to contend with speeding arrows. Uh, so, so then they're going to have an archery contest. And here, too, sadly, we have some more uh, animals being mistreated. <laughs> so you need a target for your archery contest. So they actually get a dove a live dove, and they tie it to a mast of a ship, and they're all going to shoot at the dove. So, what are you going to do? Uh, do, 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 do? So the first one shot, uh, the arrow whipped through the air to strike, and then, and then stay fixed in the mast timber. The long pole trembled, and the terrified bird fluttered. Oh. I imagine it would be pretty terrified. Uh, the second one missed the bird. Oh, missed the bird but hit the string and the bird started flying away. The next one, of course, shoots the bird. But then there's one more archer who hadn't gone. Only Acestes now remained, although the prize escaped him. Still, he bent his bow and shot into the air, showing them all his old-time archer's power and bow that sang. But here, before their startled eyes, appeared an omen of great import. Afterward, mighty events made it all clear, and poets far in the future fabled it in awe. The arrow, 
flying in thin cloud, caught fire and left a track of flame until, burnt out, it vanished in the wind, as shooting stars will often slip away across the sky, trailing their blown hair. So the last archer shoots his arrow so high and so far, it bursts into flames and vanishes in the wind. So they declare him the winner <laughs> because there was a mighty omen. Uh, then they get ready for the next thing. There's going to be races on horses. We're going to skip that. Skip that. Okay. So then, meanwhile, all this stuff is happening. All the men are competing. They're all watching. But not everything is going well. Because back at the fleet are the ladies. The Trojan women... There, and there are Trojan women. They're hanging out. They're doing their own rites in mourning for Anchises and Aesop's father um, by the ships. So Juno, seeing her chance to cause a little trouble, sends down Iris, essentially her messenger. So the Trojan women all had one thing to say, a town and home where they dreamt of, uh, uh, sick of toil at sea, taking her cue, darting into their midst, adept at doing ill, Iris put off her aspect as a goddess and her gown to take the form of aged Beroe, wife of the Temerian Doricles, blessed with noble birth, blah, 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 blah. Miserable women that we are, she said, whom no Achaean hand dragged out to death under the walls of our old fatherland. Unlucky nation, for what final blow is keep of blah, 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 for what final blow is fortune keeping you alive? We've seen the seventh summer since the fall of Troy, and all these years we've been driven on by land and sea, by hostile rocks and stars, to measure the great water in our quest for Italy, an Italy that recedes while we endure the roll of the sea swell. Here is the land of Eryx, our old brother. Here is our host, Acestes. Who prevents our building here a town for town dwellers? Country of our fathers, dear hearth gods, rescued from the enemy to no end, will never a wall be called the Wall of Troy? Uh, blah, 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 blah. Here you may look for Troy. Your home is here. Why wait? High time we acted on such portents. See there, Neptune's four altar flames. The god has fire for us. The god will give us courage. Urging them on, she picked a dangerous brand, lifted it high and swept it into flame and threw it. Taken by surprise, the women stood bewildered. Then one from the crowd, the oldest, Pergo, royal governess to Priam's many sons, cried, Do not take her for Beroe. This is not she, the Roitian, wife of Doricles' mothers, just observe what traits she has of more than mortal beauty. Her blazing eyes, her audacity, her face, her voice, her stride. I tell you, I myself left Beroe just now and she is ill. Vexed, too, that she alone missed our observance and paid no tribute to Anchises. So this one lady's like, that's not, that's not Beroe. She's a god. So urged on by the goddess, the women grab torches and attempt to set fire to all of their own ships. They're sad. They're distraught. They don't want to keep traveling. They're sick of it. And Juno, again, remember that Juno is against the Trojans, is against future Troy, 
and is trying to stop them at all costs from getting to Italy and founding Rome. So she thinks, ah, this, I will trap them on Sicily. They'll stay there. They'll live their lives. They'll build a community, but they won't get to Italy. But they are found out. <laughs> exactly. Uh, they're found out by Aeneas's son, Ascanius. He comes to them and he says, What are you doing? The women scattered here and there in fear along the beaches, in the woods, wherever they could take cover in rock caves, ashamed to face the daylight, face what they had done. For now they knew their own, and their shocked hearts were free of Juno. Uh, bah, 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 bah. So Aeneas comes, he sees what's happened. <laughs> hey, Coleman, thanks so much. Yes. <laughs> I, I, I love that little that emote. So Aeneas sees what's happening. Throwing wide his hands, he begged high heaven for help. Almighty Jupiter, unless by now you loathe all Trojans to the last man, if divine kindness shown in ancient, time, ancient days can still pay heed to mortal suffering, grant that our fleet survive this fire, Father. Even now, at the last moment, save the frail affairs of Trojans from destruction. Otherwise, do what now remains to do. With your consuming bolt, with your right hand, if I deserve it, blast me and overwhelm us. Scarce had he spoken when a black storm broke in wild fury with spouting rain. White peals of thunder shook the lowlands and high places. So Aeneas prays to Jupiter, save our ships or just blast me to bits, if that's what it's going to be. Uh, and a storm immediately comes, douses everything with rain. Uh, till all the fires were out and all the hulls except for four delivered from the burn-in. So the, the ships are saved. Um, and then Aeneas is still, he's like, well, crap, now what do I do? But he gets some... Okay, here, here we go. This is what I was looking for. Nautes, an older man, and one whom Pallas Tritonia had taught his famous thoughtfulness, she gave him answers as to the meaning of the god's great wrath on what or what the pattern of the fates required. Nautes addressed Aeneas to give him heart. So here we have an older dude who uh, knows a little bit about the gods. Sir, born of an immortal... Let us follow where our fates may lead, or lead us back. Whatever comes, all fortune can be mastered by endurance. You have Acestes, a Dardanian divine in lineage. Make him your counselor. Congenial as he is in all your plans, and now or in all your plans, and now these ships are burnt. Hand over to him the number of those they might have carried, those too weary of your great quest, your seafaring. Men who have had long lives, women worn out, blah, 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 blah. Essentially, all right, we're going to keep going. Whoever would have, whoever you can't take now because you lost four ships, leave them here with our buddy. They'll be fine. Okay, so they're going to keep going. Aeneas is still worried, though. Still anxious. Still not sure exactly what to do. Suddenly, night falls. Out of the dark... From heaven, his father's image seemed to float suddenly and speak. So after just an incredible day of all this crazy stuff happening, it's nighttime, and what happens? Aeneas's father's ghost just pops out, just appears completely randomly. Ooh, my son, dearer to me than life while life remained. And pitted now against the fates of Troy, I come by Jove's command, who drove away the fire from your ships, being moved to pity in heaven's height at last. Obey the counsel, beautiful as it is, now given by Nautes, 
embark for Italy, chosen men, the bravest. In Latium you must battle down in war, a hard race, hard by nurture and by training. First, however, visit the underworld, the halls of Dis, and through profound Avernus come to meet me, son. Black Tartarus, with its grim realm of shades, is not my home, but radiant gatherings of godly souls I have about me in Elysium. To that place the pure Sibyl, after blood of many black sheep flows out, will conduct you. Then you will hear of your whole race to come, and what walled town is given you. Farewell. Night passes midway on her wheeling course, and cruel sunrise fanned me with a breath her laboring team exhaled. And after speaking, he faded like thin smoke into the air. Aeneas cried, So soon? Where to then? Must you vanish? Are you taking flight from someone? Who can forbid you to be held by me? So there. So his father's ghost appears and says, Son, that's good advice you just got. Head out. But make a detour. Come and visit me in the underworld. We got more to tell you. It'll be great. So afterwards, they wrap up the big party. There's still festivities and sacrifices and fixing the boats and all this other stuff. Nine more days they're feasting. They're getting ready to go. Aeneas spoke to them with kindness and commended them in tears to their blood brother Acestes, so the people who that they're leaving behind. He decreed three calves be slain to Eryx and a lamb to the storm winds. So they're making more sacrifices to be able to get up and go. And uh, they, they head out onto the water. But now, beset by worries, Venus turned to Neptune. So we have a, meanwhile, the gods, unfolding from her heart complaints and pleas. So now we have Venus uh, talking to Neptune. Juno's anger and her implacable heart drive me to prayers beneath my dignity. No length of time, no piety affects her, unbroken in will by Jove's commands or fate. She never holds her peace. To have devoured a city from the heart of Phrygia's people in her vile hatred, this was not enough, nor to have dragged the remnant left from Troy through all harassment. Now she harries still Troy's bones and ashes. Uh, he reminds, or she rather reminds Neptune that Juno has taken over storms, has tried to, his domain. She took that from you. But as to what come next, I beg you, let them safely entrust their sailing ships to you across the water. Let them reach that stream, Laurentian Tiber, if one may concede these favors, if the Parkai grant their city. The son of Saturn, tamer of the deep, replied, Cytheria, you have every right to trust my kingdom. You were born from it. I uh, remember Venus was born from the sea, partly. Then, too, I've merited your trust. So often have I repressed those mad fits and that fury of heavens and the sea. On land as well, as Xanthus and Simois can testify, I cared for your Aeneas. That day Achilles, hot in pursuit, pinned Trojan troops half dead with fright against their walls and killed a myriad, making the rivers choked with corpses groan. So Xanthus could not find his bed or send his current seaward. Uh, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> Dispel your fear. He shall, as you desire, enter Avernus port. One shall be lost, but only one to look for, lost at sea. One life given for many. So essentially, Neptune is saying, they'll make it to the river that goes into the underworld, and there are lots of those, but Avernus is the one they're talking about now. But along the way, one of their crew will die. A 
essentially, it's a human sacrifice. Somebody has to die for the journey to be made for the rest of them to be able to get to and access the underworld. Uh, he assured and sheared the goddess in this way, then handed off. Uh, do, 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 do. There's a parade of sea gods who go along with him. Aeneas sees clear weather. He's excited. They head off. Um, on the leading ship, Palinurus guided the close formation, all under orders to set course by him. So remember we heard earlier, all of a sudden we heard this, about this guy Palinurus, the, uh, the steersman of Aeneas' lead ship. Now dewy night had touched her midway mark, or nearly, and the crews relaxed in peace on their hard-rowing benches took their rest, when Somnus, gliding softly from the stars, put the night air aside, parted the darkness, Palinurus, in quest of you. He brought bad dreams to you in all your guiltlessness. Upon the high poop deck the god sat down in Forbus's guise and said, Son of Iasius, Palinurus, the very sea itself moves the ship onward. There's a steady breeze. The hour for rest has come. Put down your head and steal a respite for your tired eyes. I'll man your tiller for a while. So the god Somnus, a god of sleep, comes down in disguise and tells Palinurus, The sea is calm. Everything's fine. Go take a rest. I'll watch the, I'll wa watch watch the rudder for you. The tiller, but Palinurus barely looked around. He said, "Forget my good sense for this peaceful face the sea puts on. The calm swell. Put my trust in that capricious monster, or hand over Aeneas to the tricky winds when I have been so deceived so often by clear weather." He's no dummy. With this response, he held fast to the helm and would not give it up, but kept his eyes upon the stars. Now see the god, his bow a drip with Lethe's dew, and slumberous with Stygian power, giving it a shake over the pilot's temples, to unfix, although he fought it, both his swimming eyes. His unexpected drowse barely begun, Somnus leaned over him and flung him down in the clear water, breaking off with him a segment of the stern and steering oar. Head first he went down, calling in vain on friends. The god himself took flight into thin air, but still the fleet ran safely on its course, serene in Father Neptune's promises. Born onward, now it neared the siren's reef, that old-time peril, white with many bones, now loud, far off, with trample of surf on rock. Here the commander felt a loss of way as his ship's head swung off, lacking a helmsman. And he himself took over, holding course in the night waves. Hard hit by his friend's fate and sighing bitterly, he said, For counting over much on a calm world, Palinurus, you must lie naked on some unknown shore. Poor Palinurus, could you possibly have guessed that he would be the one that had to be sacrificed? This previously unnamed character that we just were introduced to? Yeah. So again, just like in an episode of Star Trek, suddenly you find out that it's Lieutenant So-and-So is uh, part of this expedition. Palinurus is the red shirt, and so he's the one who is... Uh, Sacrificed for the greater good. A uh, here, Dinsk. Because, yes, as the gods foretold, they would have to lose one in order for the expedition to make it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. Yo, yeah, I've, I've had that happen, Eridinsk. <clears throat> Where you're on the phone, but chat doesn't work on the phone for some reason. Uh, so a momentous 
chapter. That's the end of, of that book, by the way. We had games. We had a conflagration. That was the ships being burnt. Uh, some really important stuff happens right there at the end, though, right? We get the ghost of Aeneas' father shows up, tells him he's got to go to the underworld. Uh, they head off. There's this human sacrifice element. It's pretty, pretty big stuff. Next time, we go on to book six, which is called The World Below. Now, I can't remember how much we talked about it back when we were going over the Odyssey and some of the other stories, but a common thread in ancient epic poems and stories about heroes is that the best, the mightiest heroes have an experience involving accessing the underworld gaining some kind of knowledge and coming back from that now sometimes it's literally going down into the underworld uh, sometimes it's more metaphorical it just depends um, but yes we're going to find out more about that next week with Aeneas So, uh, so that's going to be it for for the Aeneid reading today. Hopefully you're enjoying it, listening to me read and talk about it. Let's see who else is on, if anybody. I sincerely hope that the rest of my streaming this week goes as well as it did today, at least as far as connection. That would be That would be wonderful. And we don't get the uh, the annoyance of uh, what happened last week. Yes, Eridinsk, I'm 95% at this point. Uh, let's see what we got. Come on. Okay. Uh, checking to see if we are going to raid. Let's see. Uh, oh, like I said, in general... I'm expecting this to be a, a standard week of streaming. I don't think anything particularly weird is happening this week. Yes. Uh, obviously, if something comes up, I'll let I'll let everybody know. Okay, let's see. There are a whole bunch of people who are streaming. It looks like. Okay, we're going to raid a friend of ours. So many friends. You know what's been really cool uh, over this last year? I meant to talk about this before, but um, it's been really neat. So right as the pandemic kicked in to full force and we all went into quarantine, uh, obviously we and the home buddies started doing solo streaming, based essentially, and then group streams and all that. But it's been really cool since that time uh, to see all of the other people who have also started streaming. Not, I'm not saying it's like because of us or anything like that, but um, just all the people in our community who now also stream. Uh, it's been it's been really neat to see that and people making cool content and doing fun stuff. Uh, you love to see it, as they say. So we're gonna do that. And check out what Tiny Chris is doing over on her channel. I will be back here tomorrow in the morning with no rabbit wombat. You do your painting streams are great. And your the camera that you have for your painting is really good. Hopefully you'll get to do more streaming soon. Uh, tomorrow I'll be back with toys. I got some stuff that we could look at. Tomorrow will also be Dunes Day. We'll talk about that as well. Uh, okay, so go say hi to Tiny Chris. She is... What does it say? Right now it says she's just chatting, but I'm sure she'll get involved into... Um, usually she plays video games. Okay, that is starting. 
So go say hi to Tiny Chris or go off and enjoy the rest of your Monday. Make it a good one, folks. Uh, get that vaccine. It may knock you on your ass for a day or two, but it's worth it. It's all worth it. And, um, yeah. Oh, tomorrow. Okay. All right, Coleman. Good luck. Try not to schedule anything important, you know, for the next day or so after, but, but it, it's all good in the end. <laughs> all right. Uh, like I said, say hi to Tiny Chris. Have a great day, everybody. I'll be back tomorrow for Toy Tuesday. <laughs> all right. Bye-bye, everybody. Okay.